Well, welcome to Keeping It Israel, and uh, I'm your host for this podcast. And with me today is Danny Herman, Danny the Digger Herman. And uh, Danny is an archaeologist and also a first-class Israeli tour guide. And uh, Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. Well, we uh, have spent a little bit of time together, and I know that uh, it's been a while since anybody has been able to be to Israel, but uh, we were there in November 2019 yes. and had the privilege of uh, having you work with us on a documentary series that we were working on. Actually, Miraculous Victories of Israel is now fully uh, released. It's ready. And... Um, uh, just a little plug, if people want to go and find out about that, you can you can purchase the entire six episode series at MiraculousVictories.com. And uh, Danny, you were there, you were a part of that with us, took us to the city of David and, and uh, to the walls of Jericho. We had an amazing time mm -hmm. there. And what was the name of the meal that we had, the Arab meal that we had at Jericho? The thing they do with the rice and the chicken and... and uh, the oh, the upside pot, down upside. pot? Yeah. Makluba or, or ma'aluba, which literally in Arabic means upside down. Upside, it's a okay. dish that they cook with the, with the meat and the vegetables under and the rice above, and then they flip it and serve it. Yeah. It was amazing. It was a great, great meal. We had a wonderful time. Well, listen, uh, Danny, before we get into uh, the topic that we're going to talk about today, we're going to be talking about tracking Jesus. But uh, before we get there, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why Danny the Digger? How do how do you get this uh, how do you get this moniker? And um, and what's your background? Well, I'm uh, an Israeli Jew. I was uh, raised uh, in a religious kibbutz. Kibbutz is like a collective farm. It's like micro communism. We all lived in a farm where the profits were shared equally by all members. Uh, but it was an, an exception in the sense of being also religious. We had a synagogue. Most kibbutzim are very secular. Uh, and after my army service, uh, my parents said, go and study whatever you want. We'll sponsor, you know, just pursue an academic career. And archaeology was always uh, an interest. It turned into a passion. Uh, and when I decided and announced I'm going to study archaeology, my brother mocked me and said, oh, you're going to be now Danny the Digger. <laughs> And that play on words uh, eventually became my brand name when uh, I had increasing requests to guide people and I decided I should brand this. I should make you know, a brand name for my guiding services that express the fact that I'm both an archaeologist and also now kind of a business or a tour guide. And the rest is history. You know, DannyTheDigger.com is where you can find all about me and my services. Uh, and I have now actually, well, until the pandemic, I even had a team of tour guides working for me. There, there was a lot of demand. There were a lot of tourists here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. And uh, we want to thank you for taking this time today. You're coming to us from your home in Israel. And uh, I'm sitting in my home in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. And so uh, this is kind of a uh, very interesting way for us to be able to communicate and do this podcast. But uh, with the pandemic, this has become kind of our normal routine, hasn't it? Yes, same here. My wife is in front of this computer every day. She's working in the Ministry of, uh, of Education. And I appeared a few times on other TV uh, shows, and it was also all done in, in this uh, system. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about tracking Jesus. Uh, you have lots of experience uh, in the archaeological field. Uh, you've taken us to some sites, but I know that uh, you take tourists to many sites in the land of Israel when that's possible. And we're all praying that that will be possible again very soon, that the skies will open and we'll be able to uh, to get back to Israel. Amen. But yes. uh, tracking Jesus, and you're going to talk to us today uh, about, about 10 archaeological discoveries related to Jesus. We just want to help Christians today understand why the archaeology is important and also, you know, why it would be good for them to actually physically go to Israel when that is possible again and and see uh, some of these sites. You know, Christianity is based on it's based on faith. We we believe uh, what we have read. And, you know, for years as a pastor, I, I believed 
And I was one of those people that used to say, not anymore, but used to say, ah, I don't need to go to Israel. Uh, you know, I believe in God. I believe Jesus is real. I have, I have faith. Uh, it's really not that important. But I discovered, and I know that many others have discovered as well, that that an experience in Israel can really sort of change um, your whole outlook on the Bible, on the Gospels, on the truth of the Scriptures. And so, uh, talk to us a little bit about why you believe that's important. Yes, uh, first of all, what you're saying is also a common feedback that I get from my tourists. That it's it's truly a life changing experience. It's not it not only intensifies their faith; it just opens their eyes to so many dimensions of uh, what Israel is. Uh, unfortunately, we are portrayed often too negatively on the media, uh, and and when people come here, they realize that no, we're just a, a small group of people trying to defend ourselves and stick to you know Jewish culture and freedom uh, and you have to be here to realize all the small details and have some great makluba <laughs> and upper Israeli local exactly. local Israeli and Arab food it's a very similar kitchens after all um, now I personally pursued an archaeological career because as an Israeli Jew I was intrigued by what does science say about the Bible and from an aspect of archaeology because archaeology is pure science it's it's not an opinion it's not something that someone wrote with an agenda it's it's the tangible you know physical remains of that culture and uh, when I started studying I had a Eureka of, of opening a book I, I even have it here it's called the New Testament you have to understand Israelis are only familiar with what the Christian world calls the Old Testament, our Tanakh, and it was an eye-opener. I mean, I knew vaguely, as any Israeli does, about Jesus and Christianity, and all of a sudden, to read that document, it was a fascinating, it still is a fascinating document. Um, and being an Israeli, I would read about Capernaum, I would read about, you know, Pool of Siloam, and I would say, hey, I know these sites, they're, you know, right here by my house, or a two hours drive. And um, since I'm an archaeologist, I, I wanted to figure out what are the archaeological connections between the text and the site. And today, not only do I guide tourists, I actually teach it as a class at the Hebrew University. Every summer I give a summer class about archaeology in uh, the New Testament. And I find it to be a fascinating field. If you can find a site, an artifact, that illustrates any f biblical phase, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, it's magic. It's truly magic. And uh, discussing uh, this podcast, I said, you know what, let's go over the top most important sites that could relate to Jesus and, and New Testament and early Christian history. And we were both discussing this and ended up coming with a, quite an interesting list. Some of it, I think the listeners and viewers will find uh, surprising because they're not, you know, directly linked to the text of any of the Gospels, but they're still very, very important, at least in my opinion. Everything is going to be my opinion. Um, and uh, shall we start? Well, OK, so this is great. We're going to do kind of a top 10 list. Now, I'll probably age myself a little bit here. Most uh, most uh, younger people probably don't even remember who David Letterman is, but uh, uh, Letterman on late night TV used to do top 10 lists all the time. And that's kind of how we're going to approach this here today. Uh, Danny, you are more than qualified to uh, to share these with us, and I'm excited to hear um, how you explain all of these ones that we've come up with, because uh, even this first one, and, and you're going to share it in a moment, uh, people are going to take a little bit of a pause when you say it, because you wonder, well, huh, like, how does that, how does that relate to Jesus? So let's get right into them. Let's get into the top 10 archaeological discoveries that truly bring uh, Jesus to life uh, and, and, the, and the, the text of the New Testament to life as we, as we look at them. So, so what's your first one? The first one on my list is actually the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, as far as I know, are not mentioned in the Gospels. And uh, when people first hear about this, it takes a while before they realize that A, they are linked to the New Testament, and B, they are very important for understanding the New Testament. 
But first, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? So the story begins with two Bedouins uh, scouting the northern part of the Judean desert, a few miles south of uh, Jericho, when they find a cave, supposedly looking for a lost goat. I'm not sure about that part of the story. Uh, and inside were, according to their testimony, 10 jars. Um, eight were empty, one was full of dirt, and uh, one had seven wrapped scrolls inside. Can you imagine this? Now, they didn't know what they were looking at. It might be modern, who knows? So they take it to an antiquity dealer in Bethlehem who buys it for only $28, <laughs> okay? Uh, later, they, wow. later, they were purchased for a quarter of a million dollars uh, and beyond. Um, and he takes it to Professor Eliezer Lipasukenik, a professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University. I had the honor of working in the same office as, a, as an archaeology student where he once, he passed away many years ago, but that was his office many years ago. And I can only imagine Sukenik's jaw dropping when the, this antiquity dealer unwraps the towel and these scrolls uh, appear in front of him. Because as a scholar, he could tell right away that the text, the font, is not modern Hebrew, not medieval Hebrew, but it's a type of Hebrew used 2,000 years ago, in the time of Jesus, in the time of John the Baptist. Now... Finding a wow. coin, finding a, a, a pot is one thing, but finding organic material on papyrus from such a long time ago, that's impossible. That's, that's truly impossible uh, almost anywhere in Israel, except for the desert. Only in the desert, uh, the, the climate can be so dry, so hot that such items, and also so remote that such items could be preserved and not be looted shortly after they are deposited. And it was Sukenik who eventually purchased the first Dead Sea Scrolls and published them uh, saying, A, they are real, this is not some clever forgery, uh, B, they are Jewish, this is Jewish writing, and C, it's reflecting a group, uh, a fraction of Judaism from that time called the Essenes. Okay, Judaism back then, like, you know, Christianity splits to Catholic, Protestants, Greek, uh, Orthodox, Russian, you name it. Judaism also does today, and so it did in the past. Today we are ultra-Orthodox, right. Orthodox, conservative, reform. Then uh, we were split among Sadducees, Pharisees, which are mentioned in the New Testament, uh, Essenes, Sikaris, for philosophy. And I would say that G Jesus and John were also a movement within Judaism of the time. Uh, so Sukenik linked them to the Essene movement to find a genuine document of a certain Jewish philosophy from 2,000 years ago, Jeff. That's unbelievable. It's really, to this day, the most significant archaeological discovery ever made in the Holy Land, by far, far more than anything else you could think of. Because uh, the hunt that followed the initial discovery ended up uh, discovering over... 900 manuscripts in 11 caves in that area in the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea. And they're all around a site which to this day we don't know its uh, ancient name. We, we call it by its Arabic name, Khirbet Qumran, the ruins of Qumran, whatever that means. But you might ask, the listeners might ask, okay, what all of this has to do with Christianity? So here's the thing, the, the scrolls split in general, into two categories. Uh, some of it is copies of the Old Testament. They were all Jews, after all, so they venerated and copied and read um, the books of the Bible. Bible, I mean Old Testament. And we have copies from the book of Genesis to the book of Chronicles and everything in between. Only the scroll of Esther is missing from it. And maybe it's coincidence, maybe it means something. But more significant... Hmm are these independent writings of the group itself, describing themselves. And we do have some problems. They don't call themselves the Essenes. They call themselves the Yachad. Yachad, you know Hebrew, Jeff? Uh, Yachad means being together. I don't know it very well, I have to confess. Okay, so Yachad means to be together. Yeah. Being a group, we are together. Right. We follow the Moreh HaTzedek, the teacher of righteousness. And uh, we go to the desert. We heavily criticize and oppose the 
the high priest and the priests in Jerusalem because they are corrupt. And we are waiting for Messiah and we pray and we uh, keep a high level of, uh, of um, no, ritual cleansing, of being purified. Mikveh, okay? What Jews okay. follow to this day. Um, this is so, quite an, an interesting group uh, of being Jewish, but yet opposing to Jerusalem and the priests. Okay? Very, very interesting. And I want to I wanna just interject here uh, quickly. Um, one of the stops that we often make on the tours that we take to Israel is at Qumran. Um, and we are able to sort of stand on the overlook and look down and see uh, cave number five, I believe it is, where where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Cave number and, four uh, and so five, I, I yes. Know. Cave number four and five. Ninety percent of the scrolls were found in those two caves, yes. Yeah. So, you know, just to encourage people that, again, when it's possible and we have a tour on the go, we should we should go and check this out for ourselves. But, Danny, tell us why this connects you believe this connects to to Jesus. And I think you even mentioned uh, John, John the Baptist. Do we know that John was an Essene? Uh, do we do we understand that he was part of this community? Help us make that sort of Christian connection. So that's exactly the, the magic of this discovery from a Christian point of view. And let me make, make it sure. The, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls never mention any Yohanan. That's the Hebrew name of John. And the Gospels never mention any neighboring group with similar ideas, writing scrolls, or any group of people called Yahad. But John the Baptist and the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls shared so many values and even geographically were living in the same area. The Gospel tells us that John was in the desert. The Gospel tells us that John was waiting for Messiah. Okay, and the New Testament, including John, were all criticizing the corruption of the priests up in Jerusalem. These two, this person and this group of people shared a lot of values. So it's not only me, quite a few scholars suggest that John the Baptist was a member of this group. Well, I was going to just I was going to suggest uh, just reading a quick scripture here because um you know, the the Qumran is in the wilderness of Judea, which is, uh, you know, north of north of the Dead Sea and uh, south of Jerusalem, kind of kind of in that area. Help me with my geography if I'm off. It's more but, east. Um, it's southeast of Jerusalem. But yeah, you're good. Southeast. OK. Uh, and so so in Matthew three, we read that in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And uh, it goes on and says, this is he who was spoke, spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. The, the text goes on and explains, you know, how John was dressed and some of those kind of things. But, but I find it's interesting if you, if you read in there about the wilderness of Judea, which, which is where Qumran is located. Definitely. But also the reference, the reference to uh, the words of Isaiah and the fact that um, one of the major parts, uh, you know, that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was, was a, complete, uh, a complete book of Isaiah from that period. So I just wanted to sort of throw that in there. Um, and you're talking now about this possibility that, that John actually may have been part of this community. Yes, totally. And I'm not the only one to say this, but uh, the opposition to Jerusalem's uh, priest, uh, the wilderness, the messianic expectations were shared by those two groups. Where did they probably have a big ideological schism is over the meaning of the use of water. The people of Qumran kept referring to the use of water as an act, a, a, a ritual uh, for the reason of purification, which religious Jews follow to this day. Every religious woman every month goes to the mikveh at the end of her period. Okay, and uh, often people that have gone to a funeral or a cemetery will go to a mikveh to purify themselves. I see some of them going to the uh, Gihon Spring, every Friday, some religious Jews to purify before Shabbat. 
Okay, it it was once followed even more strictly, but some religious Jews still do this. The side of Qumran not only does it have eleven mikvehs, eleven ritual baths in the site, and it's a small site, so the number of ritual uh, baths by itself is an indicator of how important it was for them to purify. But the text also includes a lot of orders of how you should, almost on daily basis, purify it yourself. John the Baptist said, no, the use of water is for something else. It's to repent and prepare yourself for that Messiah. It's a new understanding. And I can only assume that once he promoted this idea, they told him, you, you cannot be with us anymore. This is a, a, an understanding that we don't share. And they split. But where does he go, Jeff? Not too far away. The baptism site, the traditional baptism site east of Jericho is about a five hours walk from Qumran. And furthermore, when he was eventually executed, it was in Machaerus, which is on, today on the Jordanian side, but it's also not too far from Qumran. You can see, you can see one from another. So these are, seem to all indicate that he was operating in the area of Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He must have known of this group. He may have even been a member of them. And so if you understand the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can understand the state of mind of John the Baptist much better. Fantastic. This, you know, just listening to you talk, this brings uh, the scriptures that we read really to life. It, it makes it it makes it so much more vivid understanding. Uh, and I can I can picture Qumran. I can picture the site. You and you and I and our crew were at the uh, the Jordan baptism site in yes. November 2019 when we were filming right. for miraculous uh, victories. And so this really, you know, John the Baptist, according to the scripture, you know, baptized Jesus. Jesus went to him to be uh, to be obedient and to be baptized in water. And this is where we have the the uh, the text about the the presence of the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove and and hearing the voice of the Father saying, this is my this is my beloved son uh, in whom I am well pleased. And so so for Christians, what we're what we're talking about really is significant and it kind of brings it to life and i feel like we could talk for a long time about this but we have we have others that we want to get to and so um what is what is number nine so we have the dead sea scrolls what's the next yes. one it's important to understand and there's a good reason why a lot of also christian pilgrimage groups come and visit qumran and you and i know the site is not that impressive but when you understand the connection to the earliest in like the inception of Christianity to John the Baptist that's the magic of the site and of course if people go there they should also go to the baptism site but after this Jesus returns now he is officially the Messiah the Holy Spirit has announced it uh, through the appearance of the dove uh, and it says that he goes to the synagogue of Nazareth. He preaches. He, he, he preaches a prophecy about the Messiah. It has been fulfilled in your hearing, right? Luke chapter four. But they reject yes. him, and they want to throw him to his death. So he moves on to Capernaum. Out of all of these sites, including the place where he grew up, archaeologically, what can we see today in Nazareth that tangibly relates to the first century? And until recently, I hate to say, it, there wasn't much. A lot of pe uh, people come to this giant, this mammoth-sized Church of the Annunciation, supposedly right over Mary's home where the angel appeared to her and announced them her becoming pregnant. And then next to it is the St. Joseph Church, supposedly where the Holy Family resided. And there's another small alley leading to the synagogue. But if, if you've been there, you, you will agree with me. You see mostly Catholic shrines and some medieval structures. And because they were venerated for, for centuries, uh, if there was anything from the first century there, it's very hard to track it today. But recently, next to the Church of Annunciation, like right across the alley, a new French organization, I hope I spell it right, and you Canadian, you speak French, so it's Centre International Marie de Nazareth. They have created... Uh, that was pretty good. Yeah, okay, <laughs> très bien. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to create a certain Catholic centre next to the Church of Annunciation, and now it's all very regulated, so... 
the uh, Israel Antiquities Authority was called in to do some salvage excavation before they can build their center. And lo and behold, they find a clear first century layer of a house, a rural house, which, which proves, as the gospel indicate, that Nazareth was a, a small town up in the hills inhabited in the time of Jesus. Okay, here for the first time, we have tangible evidence of, of such houses. And when this came out, I found that to be very, very uh, interesting, except, especially because it's right next to where Christianity claims was the home of Mary. So if this house was inhabited, it does make sense to argue that this was the neighbor of Mary and Joseph and where Jesus grew up. Uh, so that's my number nine. That's awesome. Yeah. So the Church of the Annunciation, just to clarify, um, it it is representative of the the home of Mary when the angel visited. Yes. Right. Yes. And and supposedly she was a neighbor of Joseph. And when Joseph saw this pregnant young unmarried virgin woman, the last thing he would want to do is marry her. But an angel explained to him how that has happened, and so he took her over. And so the next door is the St. Joseph Church, and that's where Jesus grew up for 30 years, which I always find very frustrating that we don't have almost any clue about those 30 years. Once he meets John the Baptist, once he's baptized, we get so many detailed descriptions of events, but 30 years of his life, think about this, except for one event when he's 12, we know nothing, nothing. And... Yet, through this new discovery and the claimed holy places right next to it, we can assume that this is more or less where he grew up for 30 years. Incredible. Now, um, just a little quick aside before we move on to number eight, but, um, you know, Jesus is depicted in, or Joseph is depicted in the New Testament as a carpenter. We assume that, that you know, Jesus in those 30 years may have followed in his father's footsteps. Uh, what does carpenter mean in the context of the Middle East? Because we have a certain we have a certain thinking in terms of of our context, working with wood and so on. Uh, is that is that really what it means in the in the text, or is there something more there? You need to go to the original Greek, which never says anything about carpentry. It gives a more general term called tekton. His father was a tecton, okay? And at some point they asked, isn't he the son of the tecton? And tecton is, is like a craftsman, okay? Uh -huh. Like uh, he could be a stone cutter. He could be, he could even be the designer of a house. After all, what's the word architect? It's architecton. It's the head of the tectons, the master builder. Okay, so, so Joseph was more like a builder, which could involve carpentry. And by the way, if he was a tecton or a carpenter or whatever, where was he working? I mean, Nazareth is a tiny hamlet by a spring up in the mountains. Where was there a need for tectons? And the, the archaeological answer is a site that's about five miles away, the city of Sephoris. Around the time, around the 20s and the 30s, Sephoris was being rapidly built by the son of Herod, Herod Antipas, and that probably generated job opportunities for Joseph and young Jesus. I argue that Jesus probably joined him for work and went there on occasional market days. And yet, unfortunately, like I said before, the New Testament doesn't care to say any, almost anything about those 30 years of his life. So Sephoris, I always like labeling as the forgotten city. But it actually probably had a big impact on Jesus growing up and his education, even on his language, because in his hometown, they probably all spoke Aramaic. In Sephoris, if you didn't know Greek, you probably couldn't do any business. Interesting. And, you know, I, when I think about the topography around Nazareth, the hills and the cliffs and the stone, um, it really wouldn't be much of a jump to think about uh, about Joseph and Jesus as, as people who worked in stone, who, who uh, were, were builders in that sense. And um, again, just another amazing way that the Bible can can get fleshed out, can sort of come to life when you're on the site and can see what is around you. Yes. And uh, I, I just find that so amazing. Now, there was another town, another place that became known as 
uh, a hometown of Jesus in his later years. This is the next one on your list. Tell us about that. Capernaum, exactly, which actually is Kfar Nahum in Hebrew. It means the village of Nahum. We don't know which Nahum the, the village is named after, if it's after the Old Testament prophet Nahum or some other local distinguished figure. But it was a tiny fishing village by the Sea of Galilee. And after Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, he does what we call today uh, a relocation. Uh, an interesting question is, why did he go there? And the Gospel of Matthew uh, provides a quote from the Old Testament to argue it's another fulfillment. And that's definitely um, a good answer, but you could also argue that he was looking for a small place without too much police and authorities where he could speak without being arrested uh, on the spot, which is what happened to mm. him in Jerusalem eventually. Uh, and Capernaum had another advantage. It's along a, a junction of trade routes. You've been there, I assume, Jeff, right? Absolutely. Many times. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, there's a road crossing it to get from the Galilee to the Golan Heights. And in ancient times, it was two different provinces. Okay. Or if you go up the, the Jordan River, you get to Caesarea Philippi, which Jesus did in the text. Then if you go down south, you end up in Jericho and it's the way to get up to Jerusalem. So it's also an important junction of roads, which might explain why Capernaum also had a taxman next to it. He was just taxing people passing in the area. And the beauty about this site is Jesus spent there about two or three years, right? And, and then the site was, in the Middle Ages, was abandoned. In fact, even its location was forgotten. Capernaum had to be rediscovered by 19th century scholars. It was re-identified by an American scholar called Edward Robinson. And being an archaeological site, that's a, a dream come true for archaeologists. I mean, I wish I could clear all the population of Jerusalem and, and dig it all up. <laughs> okay, or do the same in Rome so we know all that's left from previous periods. In Capernaum, we could do that because the site was abandoned. And the Catholic Church purchased it, and the Franciscans, which are the custodians of the Holy Land, uh, maintain the site to this day. And it, they've led several expeditions at the site, and they made some very, very interesting discoveries. First of all, they found a massive uh, stone synagogue. It's the biggest and most ornate synagogue ever found in Israel. And we have about 130 ancient synagogues across Israel. The nicest and the biggest is in Capernaum. And right next to it is a big... Um, octagonal Christian church, which by itself is surprising because Christians and Jews didn't get along that well. Either the village is Jewish or Christian. In Capernaum, there was some harmony between those two groups, surprising harmony. But this all relates to the Byzantine, to like 4th, 5th, 6th century. Beneath it, beneath the synagogue, they also found first century remains of an earlier synagogue. And that's, Jeff, the synagogue mentions in the Gospels. You know, Jesus uh, spoke in the synagogue. Jesus healed the daughter of the head of the synagogue. Um, oh. uh, um, a, a centurion donated money to that synagogue. That synagogue appears several times in the Gospels. And we have found not a lot, you know, just a corner of it buried beneath the, the what's called the white later synagogue. But it's there. You can see it. Yeah, this is this is in, this is amazing. And, and here's the text in Luke 4, 31. Here's one of the references. It says, then he that is Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people and they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. And then it says, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit, and he cried out at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus tells him to be quiet. He casts out the demon. But all of this happened in that synagogue uh, at Capernaum. And he did many other miracles there, as you mentioned, including healing the centurion's servant and um, healing Peter's mother-in-law, which, uh, you know, as a pastor, whenever I preached on uh, that text, there were always lots of mother-in-law jokes that would that would appear. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it was amazing. They say that's this... why Peter denied him later. 
<laughs> because he healed his mother-in-law. You know, because he healed his mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, but anyhow, just just amazing to think about. And uh, I, I know that there's some other significant things about the synagogue as well. But uh, I love hearing you talk about it. So if you have other things to share, go ahead. Well, I, I want to share with you the next site, which kind of links to it, because besides preaching in the synagogue of Capernaum, the text tells us that he wandered around the this, this Sea of Galilee and in the Galilee itself, and he would go to synagogues in those villages and preach there as well. And uh, it's apparently that during that time that he gets to know a woman called Mary. And Mary is named after her hometown, which is Migdal. We all know her as Mary Magdalene, right? And Magdala, which Josephus calls Tariche, uh, was discovered as well. First of all, there was an Arab village there until the 19th century by the name of Majdala. So we knew it had to be in that area. And then again, the Franciscans purchased that plot and started uh, digging it already in the 1970s. But recently, they launched a new project in the northern outskirts of the town without many expectations. And lo and behold, I think it was 2009 when they found a first century synagogue, not with anything over it, pure first century. I was amazed. I quickly ran there to uh, drove and I had to see it for myself because finding a first century synagogue is rare. We do have, I said, over 100, 30 ancient synagogues found in the land of Israel, but most, most of them are from a later period. Finding ones from the time of Jesus is, is exceptionally rare. We have one in Masada, in Herodium, in Gamla, traces the corner of one in Capernaum, and now we have another one. But where's the magic, Jeff? If this is first century, if this is the hometown of Mary Magdalene, if the text tells us that Jesus went and preached in synagogues, you cannot rule out the possibility that this is the very synagogue where he joined the session, he started preaching, and one of the women sitting there and listening to him was a woman called Mary. And she was enchanted by his, by his approach, by what he was saying. She followed him from that moment and on. Is this the synagogue where they saw one another for the first time? I cannot prove it, but you cannot rule out that possibility. So, so these possible links, in my opinion, is what makes the Magdala Synagogue, my number seven on that list, also a very highly important site. So there's a couple of key texts here. Uh, Ma Matthew 15, 39 says he sent away the multitude and, and took ship and came into the coasts of Magdala. So we know he's in the region. Uh, this is Jesus. And then in, in chapter nine and verse 35, what you referred to, it, it tells us specifically Jesus went through all, says all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And so it's it's incredible to think the first time I went to Magdala, I hadn't I had never been, obviously, because it was my first time. Uh, and I was just like you. I was so amazed at uh, what it was that was was being explained to us. And since that time, I've been back many times. Uh, Father yeah. Amon Kelly, who is there, has become a, a good friend. And, and we, um, you know, I try, even if I'm just driving by, I try and drop in and, and say hi to him. But uh, it's just incredible to think about the, the uh, fish processing plants that were there. Uh, the synagogue kind of right next to that part of the town. Uh, now they've found a number of, of homes and also mikvahs in the area mm -hmm. as well, all from the first century. And it's just, it's, it's kind of almost mind blowing to think uh, about the fact that, you know, that the, the Magdala stone, which is another very interesting artifact that they found uh, sitting in this first century synagogue, um, you know, that, that Jesus may have stood somewhere right there and, and taught. And as you said, maybe Mary heard him for the very first time. And so yes. a very, very, very um, just incredible way of, of bringing the scripture potentially to life for people. Yes, definitely. And I'll never forget in one of my visits when they were still uh, excavating the synagogue, 
they were going with a metal detector where the seats are, and all of a sudden uh, the machine blinked and she scooped out a little earring. Okay, a ah. golden earring, which I found to be very important because A, it proves that women also attended synagogues, not just men. I mean, today it's also men and women, but the women are usually in the back. Apparently in antiquity, they all sat together. We didn't have this gender separation like we do today. And then I joked with the archaeologists, hey, you cannot rule out the possibility that it, it fell from the ear of Mary Magdalene. <laughs> now, of course, it's a, <laughs> it's a cute thought, but the, seriously, I mean, the, it adds another argument to say that women could have been in that synagogue with men listening to whoever was standing next to that enigmatic decorated stone. And you cannot seriously rule out the possibility. It makes so much sense that Jesus was at some point preaching in that very structure as well. Yeah. Now, Magdala, I mentioned about the fish processing plants. I know that uh, a number of coins were found in the houses um, near that area as well, uh, sort of between where the, the mikveh are and the, uh, and the sea. Um, what do we know about the town itself? Was was it a, a place that was prosperous? I mean, you mentioned it being along a trade route. Yes, like Capernaum, it's also on a trade route, and Magdala literally means a tower. But the Aramaic name of the place, which kind of connects to the Greek name, Tariche, it means salted fish. So we think that Magdala, unlike Capernaum, was not just a fishing village, it was really a town that uh, was prosperous from um, processing fish and then selling them to merchants that would mark, uh, distribute it towards uh, Sephora and Midland. Uh, and another very important thing to understand about Magdala, unlike Capernaum and pretty much any other site, it ended in a terrible tragedy. But tragedies are very good for archaeologists. You know, Pompeii ended in a disaster in that eruption in 79. Magdala was destroyed about a decade earlier by the Romans. Some, some 30 years after Jesus and Mary Magdalene was, were there, the Jews in general revolted against the Romans, and Magdala specifically was conquered in a very violent uh, conquest and was never settled again. So today when we excavate Magdala, you just need to scoop the surface off and, and the walls appear and... and the mosaic floors and the mikvehs and a synagogue. So Magda is amazing in the sense that it presents directly the layer of the time of Jesus. It is amazing. And so understanding that this was potentially a prosperous town, we, we also have indication in the scripture that, that Mary Magdalene was a woman of some financial means and that her and some of the other women who who supported and, and traveled with Jesus also helped to to financially support as well. And uh, so yeah. all kinds of incredible tie ins to to the text, which I think is uh, is very, very interesting and uh, and very unique. It's a place if you're listening, if you're watching, it's a place that you absolutely must go to uh, if you are in Israel. I I just think it's it's one of the most incredible sites that um, that you can check out and the region as well. And so the um, the other the other one that we want to get to is um, number six on your list, which is also very close, very close by located yes. very close. So so talk to us about uh, about the next one. Um, so it's really in the vicinity of Magdala. It may, maybe even was headed towards that area. Uh, a truly a sensational discovery made in 1986 when the water level was exceptionally low in the Sea of Galilee after a, a set of uh, dry years. Um, north of Magdala, you have a kibbutz called Ginosar which is preserving the name of an ancient village called Gennesaret. And on that specific late winter, early spring, two brothers of the kibbutz, which I know them personally, Yuval and Moshe Lopan, were just mm. strolling along the coast. They are archaeology fans, 
and they uh, like to to uh, poke around and see if they find any treasures. You know, they're they were hoping to find maybe a coin or some perforated stones. These perforated stones were ancient anchors. But about 300 meters south of Ginosau, towards Magdala, they notice in the mud that now surfaced an elliptic shape. And they start, you know, cleaning it up and it's made out of wood with some metal uh, connecting uh, items in between them. And they realize this is a vessel. This is like an ancient, like a boat. But is it ancient? We don't know. So the Israel Antiquities Authority uh, is called in with marine archaeology experts, uh, and they start exposing it. But then, oy vey, it started raining up north, and the Jordan River started feeding the Sea of Galilee. So the water level was gradually rising, and there was a, a chase to get that that wreck out of the mud before uh, the water level it increases and covers it up. And eventually they succeeded. But what is it? So um, carbon-14, are you familiar with carbon-14, Jeff? Maybe I'll describe it for the yes. listeners. It's, it's an independent system to date organic material. The, the guy who discovered this got a Nobel Prize and it's a very um, a clear scientific method to date any organic material. It was used, by the way, one of the first time to date the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was, it proved that the Dead Sea Scrolls were indeed genuine, and it also proved that carbon-14 technique works. Okay, it really yeah. can tell you the date of of organic items, and and a wooden vessel is organic. So the results of the carbon-14 tests, a test indicated that vessel. Listen carefully, it's again, first century. Now, that's mind-boggling because it's it's a wooden boat in a very damp, humid area. It was actually left in the water, but miraculously it was dropped, it was abandoned in a muddy area, and the mud covered it and protected it from oxidization. But there's a specific story that relates to it in such a great way. It's possibly the most famous miracle that Jesus performed in the north around the Sea of Galilee, which is walking on water, right? Every right. every Christian child, every human being, I think, knows about this specific story. What people do not realize, and maybe you'll find that quote, is at the end of the story of walking on the water, it says, and they landed in Gennesaret. <laughs> which is exactly where that boat was found. So as I like telling people, wow. you cannot prove, but you cannot disprove the possibility that this boat was in that story. And because it was already in bad condition from the heavy tides, they just dropped it. Okay, I cannot prove it, but you cannot disprove right. it. And I find that also to be a magical connection to the scriptures. That's, uh, I, that reminds me of your quote. Uh, the absence of evidence is not, not evidence, evidence of, absence. of absence. Yes, that that exactly. relates to more of Old Testament material. Uh, in, in this context, it's a repeated theme that I like saying: you cannot rule out the possibility. <laughs> I think I use yeah, it already exactly. three times in this interview. Uh, I don't have proof often, but the fact that you cannot disprove the possibility that these discoveries relate to this text is what makes it so magical. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention before we end end this part with the boat is, uh, you know, we talked about that story where the storm came up, the squall, where he calmed the storm and said, peace be still. Um, quick story. We I think it was my very first tour to Israel and we left the the shores of, of Galilee on the on the um, uh, the side opposite Ginosar. We got into one of the boats there and went out to do our, you know, our little tour on the water. And when we left the shore, it was bright and sunny. It was a beautiful day. The sky was blue. And um, I remember it was, about, we had only been out about 20 minutes and all of a sudden the wind picked up and it began to, to sort of sprinkle rain. And then within about five more minutes, it was raining like, like almost sideways. And the wind was so strong that uh, one of the guys that was that was with us on the tour, he had one of those poncho things, you know, to to keep him dry, and he pulled it over pulled it over his head, and he put up the hood, 
And uh, he was standing up on the bow of the boat. And I remember I looked up, I got a picture of it actually. He's standing on the bow of the boat and the wind has blown this poncho straight up in the air, like, like a cone from his neck. He looked like, uh, you know, one of those dogs that has to wear a cone after surgery. Uh, it, yeah. it was, it was like phenomenal. And I remember wow. thinking, I remember thinking that this is amazing how that a storm can blow up so quickly uh, on this on this body of water, this lake. And it kind of gave credence, uh, you know, to the story to me when when Jesus uh, and the disciples were out on the water and the storm came up so fast. So uh, just another another way that the Bible comes alive when when you're in Israel. It was amazing. Totally. What hour of the day was it, Jeff? Do you remember? Was it the morning or the afternoon? Oh, boy. That was 2006. But I think it was after lunch. I think it was it was afternoon. I thought so. The afternoon, it's it's a, almost a daily thing there. In the afternoon, the wind catches up in the Sea of Galilee. And especially on the eastern side, not so much on the west, but you were exactly at the, at the time of the day and in the geographical area where it can get really messy uh, in that part of the Sea of the Galilee. Very cool. Well, that's that even that makes it even more amazing to me. But uh, <laughs> I, I just I just remember thinking, you know, this is this is incredible. And um, it's like you're it's like you put yourself in the in the story almost, you know. And when you when you go to Israel, when you travel to Israel and you go to some of these sites that we're talking about and others that we will that we will mention, you're going to you're going to feel some of those very same feelings. If you're watching, if you're listening, um, it is it is one of those experiences that um, nobody experiences the same way exactly, but it impacts you in an incredible way, no matter no matter who you are uh, or, or sort of what your outlook is. If you're somebody who believes, you know, the Bible and believes in Jesus, then this is this is an incredible, incredible thing. Some say that coming to Israel is a, is a fifth gospel, is experiencing a, or reading, is like reading a mm. fifth gospel. And, and you're demonstrating that it's not just seeing antiquities, it's also going on a boat and experiencing the wind and the waves that really makes all the scripture come alive, definitely. Well, this has just been a fascinating discussion about the uh, the boat of Galilee or the Jesus boat, as most of the uh, people that I've talked to, uh, you know, call it in terms of uh, the common vernacular. I think it's just incredible. And uh, I also, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very impressed that you know these two guys uh, that actually found this. It's an amazing story. And um, if you come to Israel, you're going to you're going to see the story. There's a little video about how they found it and everything they did to to get the boat moved out. But for us, the significance is that uh, it very well could be that boat or a boat like that, uh, that Jesus taught from, that he rode in with his disciples. And so uh, it's just uh, just an incredible conversation. Danny, thank you for uh, sharing that with us. And for sharing these first five of the uh, top ten, top ten things that we're talking about, the archaeological discoveries that connect to Jesus, I think that today we're going to maybe wrap the podcast here, and uh, and do another one with uh, with the other five. You think you're good with that? Yeah, sure. There's a lot to digest from a listener's point of view, a lot to contemplate about. So let's give them a rest. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, thanks so much for being with us on the podcast today. And uh, we look forward to next week when we uh, count down five to, to number one. Okay. Shalom. Bye bye. Well, thank you for tuning in to Keeping It Israel today. I hope that you enjoyed the show. And uh, our guest, Danny the Digger, was so engaging. If you want to find out more about him, you can go to his website, dannythedigger.com, and we would encourage you to uh, check that out. First Century Foundations is a ministry that exists to support the land and the people of Israel and to educate Christians about the Jewish roots of our faith. We are a charity that relies on your generous donations. And so if you like the show, if you like keeping it Israel, then please consider giving. You can also visit firstcenturyfoundations.com to learn about the many humanitarian projects that we support in Israel and to find out how you can be a critical part 
part of the work that we do. Thank you for your giving. Your generosity is making a huge difference in so many lives in Israel today. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on First Century Foundation's YouTube channel or like us on Facebook so that you can stay connected to us and to our ministry. We also ask if you're listening to this podcast on one of your favorite podcasting platforms that you would subscribe to the podcast there as well. All of these things help us. And uh, if you went and left a review, that would even be so much better. Hey, the land and the people of Israel. They have a special place in God's heart and a critical role in history more than ever before. We want you to remember, as Christians, we stand with Israel. Mm -hmm.